All right, boys. Thanks for joining me. You bet. We got Ryan Quinton. Ryan, raise your hand. We got Mikey Hammond. Best friends for how many years you guys been best friends? Well, I mean, we met each other in 2006, 2005, 2006, but then we weren't really friends until 2008, 2009, 2010. 10, 2010. Yeah. And you became roommates and bunkmates sometimes? Yeah, well, we met when we, but like, I, I mean, I didn't know Michael Hammond well, you know, at all. And he, we played this volleyball tournament together. And after, that was like probably like the first time we had really ever like hung out for any time. And like after that volleyball tournament, me and some of my other friends from Canada were like going back to Canada um, for Thanksgiving. And Michael, who literally like we hung out with him that one day was like, hey, you guys are going back to Canada? I always wanted to see that part of Canada. Can I come with you? Can I come with you to stay with your guys' families in Canada for a week? And we were just like, yeah. And so... <laughs> Michael came up and then we all we just like immediately became like really good friends and then when when we came back down from Thanksgiving um Michael he was living with his grandparents at the time and so then when that new semester started in January I think then Michael just moved in with us and then we were roommates for a long time and for a long part of that time we slept in a room where there was like four beds all pushed together in one room and me and Michael slept in the two beds beside each other I'd often wake up and his mouth is like open like right by my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, next thing you know next thing you know you guys are always a, a tandem Halloween yeah couple Next right. thing you know, Q-tips uh, Q and Tom and Jerry, man, back <laughs> back Halloweens. <laughs> All right, well let's uh let's get going. I know you don't have a ton of time, so I think uh, we could entitle this episode as "The Things We Do for Love." <laughs> <laughs> It's a lot of things we we've done in our lives for for women. No question. Yeah. Okay, Ryan, take us away with the. Okay, well, this was a this is a story of young love. I. So the summer this is the summer after my mission. Okay, so I'm 21 and or maybe 22, and I'm living in Canada, and like many return missionaries, I did door-to-door -door security sales. But unlike many return missionaries, I was very bad at it. And so <laughs> um, I hated that job so much and was so bad at it, and so mostly just didn't work. Mostly just saw every movie that came out that summer with me and another buddy that was also hated sales. And... So it was just like a really fun summer, but not very financially good. Um, so one day we're like looking for something to do to, so that we don't have to knock on people's doors. And our other buddy, who's, who's actually like a really good sales guy, he's like, hey, you guys want to go see Taylor Swift tonight? She was playing a concert. This is in Edmonton, Alberta. And often when I tell this story, people want to know which tour. So I'll tell you, it's a fearless tour. Okay. And... Uh, so we were like, yeah, I want to go see Taylor Swift, but like, we don't have tickets. And he's like, we don't need tickets. And we're like, what? And he's like, just trust me. So we, we put it, we're wearing like our, our security salesman uniform. So we have just like a black jacket and a baseball cap and then like a lanyard with a name badge. It's all this. So we show up to the stadium a few hours before the concert starts. And he's like, he doesn't even really have a plan. And so I'm like thinking like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna figure this out. I'm gonna, we're gonna scheme our way into this. I'm like, okay guys, here's what we should do. We'll pretend to be, we'll pretend to be like audio guys. And we see kind of outside of the stadium, there's like this room where some people, some workers seem like they're going in and out of. And so, and so uh, I'm like, okay, let's go in there. So we go in there and we're like, oh yeah, hey, we're, we're uh, some audio guys. We just make up a name. We're like, we're supposed to meet like uh, James or somebody inside there. He said to go in and they're like, what, James? They're like, who do you work for? And uh, we're, they're like, uh, and they're like, you, know, you, need, you don't need to talk to James. You need to talk to this other guy. We'll go get him. You guys stay here. We'll go get him. He's like the audio guy. 
So then we're like freaking out. Oh, they, we don't know this guy. So then when they leave to go get the guy, we just run away. <laughs> and uh, so then my bud, the, the guy who, who brought us there, he was like, Look, we don't need some complicated plan. He's like, just follow me. And so, so there's another door, a door that's going like right into the stadium where like staff are going in and out. And there's just like a security guard by this door. So he just starts walking towards it. And so we follow him. He doesn't even say anything to the security guard person at the door. He just holds up his, his, his badge from work and just keeps walking. And the person doesn't even say anything. And so we're, me and my other buddy, Josh, we're behind him. And so we just do the same thing, hold up our badge and then we're in, you know? So now we're inside this football stadium. Still the concert is like a few hours from starting. And I'm like so amped, like, I can't believe we did that. You know, like if that had been the end of the story, I think it would have been one of the coolest things ever. Like we snuck into this concert, saw Taylor Swift, you know? Um, at the time, I didn't even really know any Taylor Swift songs or anything, but it's just like, it was cool. We, we were like, cool, sneaking in. But this guy that we're with, he like does stuff like this all the time. And at this point, he's like not even close to satisfied of like the stuff he wants to try to do. So he doesn't even hesitate. As soon as we get in, he just keeps walking straight towards the backstage entrance. We walk towards the backstage entrance. There's two big security guards now standing on each side of the door. He does the same thing. He just walks right up to him, holds up his little badge. They open the doors for us. And then we like walk and now we're backstage. And so now we're just hanging out backstage and it's cool, but it gets pretty boring, you know, because everyone's just like setting up stuff. And so we don't know what to do. We're just kind of walking around, looking around. And, but now that we're backstage, there's another door and this door leads to like the floor of the stadium, like where all like the general admission people are going to be. And so we go to that door and there's a person in charge of just like, manning that door and so then since they see us coming from backstage they open the door for us to go onto the floor but now since they've seen us it's like they recognize us and so now for the rest of the concert they just let us back and forth back and forth because they're like oh yeah i let those guys out from backstage so they assume we belong backstage so then we're like just like testing that out so we like hang out on the floor for a while and then we go back to the person and then we like hey and they're like oh hey guys and then they open the door for us so we're just going back and forth um and now the concert's like it's getting close to starting, but there's like one area we still can't get to. And it's like, it's like kind of like this, this caged off area that's like right by the stage. It has this kind of like a little like chain link type fence around it. And in order to get in there, you need like a VIP bracelet, you know, so you can be like right up by the stage. And so we were like, well, our security outfit is not going to get us into like the VIP area. And so we're like, we need one of these bracelets that everybody's everybody has and so we're like trying to think how can we get one of these bracelets and so we uh we look up on our phones we like find the name of taylor swift's manager i think it was like james allen or something allen i don't know and so and so we find there's a person who is like letting people into the vip area and giving them bracelets like they bring them their ticket and then they scan the ticket and then they give them a bracelet and let them in and so we send our our one buddy up there to be like to pretend to work for her manager. And so he goes up there and he like has a clipboard and he's like, hey, yeah, I work for, uh, for whatever, Alan or the, the Taylor Swift's manager. Some of his nephews are in town. And so he, he's arranged for some of them to pick up bracelets. He's gonna send a guy to pick up bracelets from you. So when that guy comes and tells you that, that he's from Mr. Allen, just give him three bracelets, okay? And so then she's kind of confused, but she's like, oh, okay. And so, so then we leave and then we send another good other guy to go and he's like, oh, hey, I don't know if someone came and talked to you. Uh, I'm here. I work for Taylor Swift's manager. I'm supposed to pick up three bracelets. And she's like, oh, oh yeah, someone did come tell me that. And so she's about to give him the bracelets. But then like another person is now standing beside her, the bracelet person. And she seems kind of more like in charge. And she's like, whoa, whoa, what? Like, who are you giving these bracelets? You can't just give these out. And so then my buddy's like, well, no, I work for the manager. And she's like, you need to talk to Chris. Chris is like, apparently the guy who's in charge of the production company that's putting on the concert. And so, so my buddy's like, oh, do you have like his phone number? And uh, she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he gets the phone number. So we have the phone number and then we give it to our one buddy who's like the mastermind of this whole thing. And 
he's he's like he's from georgia and so he kind of has like a southern accent which we thought that might be somewhat believable that he could be somehow connected to taylor swift and so um he calls the guy and the guy answers the, the phone and this guy he calls him he gets scared and so he immediately just hangs up on him because he's like i didn't know what to say and so we we're like that's all right you know this was like a crazy long shot like this has already been such a crazy day but then a few minutes later the guy calls him back he calls him right back after he hung up on him and so then our buddy answers the phone and he's like hey who's this and and our buddy's like oh hey he's like i'm a, i'm nephew of of taylor Swift's manager you probably know him he said that if i talked to you you could get me some bracelets and he's like chris is like oh yeah yeah you just need to come meet me come meet me over in this spot are you like at the concert right now and he's like oh yeah, yeah i'm at the concert i'll go meet you and so he so he's like okay i guess i'm gonna go meet the guy and so he takes off like his security jacket and hat so now he's just wearing like a t-shirt and jeans so he looks just like a normal so he leaves and we're like there's no way he's coming back with like he's gonna come back with police and we're gonna get thrown out of here is what's gonna happen and about five minutes later he comes back three bracelets in his hand and we're like what happened and he's like I met the guy and uh, he was, he was like asking me, oh yeah, so you're like Ron Allen's nephew or whatever. And he's like, yeah, yeah. And, and he's like, do you have any ID on you or anything? And the guy's like, uh, yeah. And uh, he's going to like reach into his wallet. Like his name is Jackson DeRoche. Like he, there's no, I don't know what he's going to say. Um, and he's just about to pull out his ID. And then the guy's like, oh, you know what? Don't worry about it. I know you're Ron's boy or whatever. And so he just gives him the bracelets. So now we have these bracelets. We get into the VIP area. The concert's about to start. Especially at that time, Taylor Swift's fans were all 12-year-old girls, and I'm 6'2", right? So I'm just much taller than everybody else that's there. <laughs> Taylor Swift comes out. Everyone's reaching up for her, but, like, I can reach so much higher than everybody else that Taylor Swift, as soon as she comes out, she grabs my hand while she's singing, starts singing to me one of the songs. And I'm like, you know, I'm about Taylor Swift's age, you know? So I'm thinking is there a connection here between us? And uh, <laughs> then she, she does the rest, you know, she's singing some more. Another song later, you know, she comes back by, I'm with my hand still up. She grabs my hand a second time. Okay, so now I'm like, okay, there's a connection, you know, there's something here. So the concert ends and um, at that time, okay, she was, she was touring at like some random stops that she was going to. She was with Kenny Chesney, okay? And so Kenny Chesney is now about to come out. And my friends, for some reason, they're like, they want to stay to watch Kenny Chesney. I'm like, I'm going backstage. I'm going to go try to meet Taylor Swift. And so I go back to our friends at the doors that like recognize me. I say, hey guys, they, yeah, they let me in. So now I'm backstage. And this is just as Taylor Swift has come off. And so I can see it's, it's outside and there's like a semi truck in this backstage area. I'm on one side of the truck. She's on the other. I can see her legs kind of walking underneath the truck. And so I'm like walking along beside the truck and I'm thinking like, I'm going to bump into her. And on, when we come around the truck and I'm just going to be like, Oh, Hey Taylor and ask her to, to hang out or something. So I'm walking along. As soon as she comes around the, the end of the truck though, she gets swarmed by all these like security people or whoever, and they bring her into this, other kind of building that's in there. And I'm now I'm by myself. I'm not with my buddies. I'm like nervous. And so I was like gonna go in, but then I see all these security, I get kind of scared. And so I kind of just start kind of backing off, walking around. But from our like ex exploring backstage, I knew that there was like another entrance into that building that she went in. So I'm like, oh, I'll go around to that other entrance. So I'm like walking around to that other entrance. And when I get around to it, there's just like one security guard there. And so I'm like thinking, okay, I'm gonna go in, I'm getting ready, psyching myself up, I'm going, I'm gonna try to find Taylor Swift. As I'm thinking this, Taylor Swift comes walking right down the hallway, right out the door, like that I'm right outside of. And so I'm kind of like surprised, you know? And, and she's about to get in her car. And so it's like me and her and basically alone, you know, there's like a few people around. And she sees me and she looks at me and says like, hey, you know, how's it going? And I'm so shocked that like, this is, this worked. And now I'm face to face with Taylor Swift. She was wearing like this gold sparkly dress, you know, she, she was looking very beautiful. And so I'm kind of just stunned, like, and, and so I don't say anything back, you know? And she's like looking at me, waiting for a response and I'm not saying anything. Then in my mind, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm not saying anything. I'm looking like an idiot, right? I need to say something, you know? 
But while, while I'm thinking that time is more time is passing and I'm still not saying anything, eventually she gets kind of just weirded out and she's like, okay, well, see you later. And then I'm thinking, oh, I'm so dumb. Like now, now what am I going to say? I'll see you later after I didn't say anything. And so again, I don't say anything. And she just kind of looking at me, gets in her car, drives away. I never see her again. <laughs> oh, dude. That's classic, man. That's a good story. <laughs> now, I've heard that story because I've been, I lived with Ryan probably about six years of my life, you know? So I've heard that story probably almost 20 times, maybe. <laughs> and let me tell you, it does not change because a lot of people are like, oh, that's not real. That's not real. I'm like, it is real. Like, I know one of the guys that he was with, Josh, like he's a friend of mine. And so it's like kind of crazy, you know, and people, it's kind of an outlandish story. People are like, no way, no way that happened. But I'm telling you, it never changes. And so <laughs> if there's any indication that that story is true. I feel like details would be kind it's of, yeah. yeah, you know, but every single detail, it's always the same, you know, and it's. <clears throat> Dude, I haven't heard, I heard that story from you, Ryan, like six years ago, and I forgot most of it. That was good, man. <laughs> yeah. um, looking back, though, in hindsight, you probably dodged a bullet, man. If you, if you were your normal charismatic self and you started dating Taylor Swift, she would have pulled you in, your web, in her web and chewed you up and spit you out and jacked you over and wrote a love song about you and made a million dollars off it while you're just in the gutter. <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's what i tell myself to say you know what you know it probably wouldn't have worked out for the best so. <laughs> awesome um you guys want to tell me real quick about your your quests for love your love quest or whatever you guys did yeah well i mean that was a that was a real theme of especially my life you know was like I would always love these girls that were like, that didn't like me or were far away or something. And so I'd, I'd go on these quests, you know, to try to win their love, love quests, but I could never go alone. And so I had the man they call King Wing, you know, he's the ultimate wingman. <laughs> and so never before would there, was there anyone who was just like so invested in, also invested in me finding love, you know, it felt like there <laughs> He was almost as motivated as I was. And so he would just be the ultimate wingman. You know, we go on all these love quests, often up to Idaho, you know, not the, um, not a lot going on up there. And so we'd go up to Idaho and, and truly never worked out. <laughs> Dude, Ryan, you probably don't know this, but we're in Peru. Yeah. Speaking of Michael's invested interests, <laughs> we're in Peru. I propose. Yeah. Rachel's wearing a ring, but she has it flipped. So you can't see the diamond. So yeah, it looks yeah. like a regular ring. Or whatever. It was like a fake. It was like a, a cheap fill-in ring. Anyway, I don't even know if it had any diamonds on it. <laughs> Anyway, she had it flipped around because we hadn't told anyone yet. And we're standing there in our Airbnb. There's like 11 people there. We're all standing around this crowded kitchen trying to taste these new exotic fruits someone just bought at the market. And Mikey looks down <laughs> and he notices. He's like, wait, what's this? And he grabs her hand and he like turns her hand over. <laughs> and it's like a real ring. And he goes, oh, what is this? And he looks at her and he looks at me and he immediately starts crying <laughs> and he's like i'm so happy for you guys <laughs> and we're like laughing our heads off and he leaves and he comes back like 10 minutes later and he's like i just went upstairs and i said a prayer for you guys and i was so <laughs> thankful <laughs> that's true that is a fair gratitude <laughs> that is a perfect story of Michael Hammond where like he's just so motivated for his his buddies to find love you know there's not yep. a better wing man out there <laughs> and through three groups of friends where pretty much every single one of them have got married off you know yeah <laughs> well I 
I've always felt like, oh, I can't get married until all these guys, you know, get married. Because you're the king wing, man. King wing. So what are they going to do without me, you know? (laughs) She'd talk about, speaking of wings, she would talk about ducks and duck boats. Let's do it. So I'd like this girl. So I had moved to Boston um, and Ryan had lived there for two years prior. And that summer um i went there there was this girl that i had known for a long time and like i went to jerusalem with her like years before like probably eight years before you know six seven years before and so i've known her for a long time but things never kind of worked out but i was always somewhat interested anyways finally she she told me that she would she really wanted to go on a duck boat tour and she was going to pa school out there and i had just started dental school and so I, you know, I, I saw, I knew she wanted to go on a duck boat. So I, the, our first date was on this duck boat. And this is after years of me, like, you know, trying and not trying to get with her. And so finally I'm on a date with her after like seven years. Right. And <laughs> the day before we had gone out to get barbecue with me and another roommate. And I like didn't think anything of it. You know, I eat food all the time and it seems fine. So I go the next, so then the next day we, we go on this duck boat and as we're going on the duck boat within the first, I'd say it's a two hour long tour, right? And they go in the water, they go on land. There's no stops. There's no bathroom on it. Within the first 15 minutes, I have to go diarrhea. <laughs> so bad and it is it is hot right it's in the middle of summer in boston humid and again i'm on this date with this girl that i really wanted to go out with for a long time and 15 minutes i don't know what to do you know like because now i have another hour and 45 minutes i got to sit on this but i have to go explosive diarrhea (laughs) So then I get to the point where I'm like, okay, maybe I should just go like a little bit, like release a little bit. Wait, 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 though. Before, I mean, did you ex- explain that the duck boats, that it's like a bus, right? It starts out as a bus, right? But now you're in the middle of a river, right? You're like locked in. There's not no, yet. There's yet. no not way to get off of this That's thing. Not, yeah, I'm not, I'm not there yet. Okay. So <laughs> you, you first drive around the city. Right, right. You're driving first. In the and bus. so, but you know, within the first well, 10, 15 minutes, I'm like, I got to go. <laughs> While we're stopping though, can we, maybe you're going to get to this, but can we say how bad of an idea it is to think that you could just go a little bit of diarrhea? <laughs> <laughs> I was wearing jeans. And so I thought, oh, they're a little bit thicker. So it's not like going to bleed through. I'm telling you, and I, you know, after I tell the story and people kind of tell me, oh, that would have been a bad idea. I kind of like, maybe I was delirious. I don't, because I had a goal so bad that I'm just like, anything. I would do anything, you know? And so, so I'm like gone. And I am like, at this point, like I'm sweating. I'm getting like the diarrhea chills, you know? I'm sweating down, you know? And then I'm like looking over here at her, at her and just like trying to be pleasant, you know? But inwardly just everything's churning and like, I'm like freaking out. You know, and so I'm like really trying to focus on on like what the person's saying, like the tour guide saying. And so by the end of this tour, like let me tell you, I know Boston like the back of my hand. Like I I can give people tours of Boston so well because I was trying trying to just so focus because I was like trying to keep my mind away from pooping my pants. And so, you know, so you know, 15 minutes in, I'm starting to I try to fill out, but my body will not let me go to the bathroom. And then, you know, half an hour goes by. I'm like thinking. This is key. He tried. You tried to go. And I could not go. And so then I'm like, okay. You know, it's, it's been like maybe half an hour now, you know, and I'm like, I'm like scanning the, just trying to figure out what is a way that I can get up, you know, like this boat so I can go to the bathroom. And so I'm, but it's kind of high up off the ground. You can't just like jump off, like. And plus, it's like my first date with this girl. It would be like so weird. All of a sudden, like I take off and like, what? 
<laughs> jump out of the bus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so it's like an old World War II landing craft. Like it's, so it's like this big old thing that's like raised off the ground, you know. So then I see a porta potty from like a construction site. And I think, and we're stopped at a stoplight. I'm thinking, this is my chance. You know, if I'm going to go, like, this has got to be it. But again, all these like conflicting feelings of like, you can't leave her. This is like so weird if you leave her or whatever. And I'm like, oh yeah, I like, can't do that, you know? Um, anyways, fast forward another half an hour. This is after me literally trying to go multiple times in my pants, but my body <laughs> will not let me. You're now in the water. And you're in the water, it's like another half, it's like a half an hour. <laughs> you're in the middle of the Charles River. And so I'm, I'm thinking, well, I'm going to jump off this boat right now and I'm just going to go in the water and I'm going to swim away. You know, I cannot, I have to go that bad. And the Charles, Charles River is not a river you should generally yes, swim. It's very That's dirty. Added layer. People, yeah. you, know, you don't want to swim in it, right? But I don't, I'm not thinking that. I'm just thinking I am going to poop all over this bus. You know? <laughs> so I finally just, I, I'm able to just not go. We're getting closer and as we're approaching we kind of we go back into like the like downtown boston area prudential center back bay and there's like a uh, grocery store there and whatnot and i hear the tour guide at like the end of the tour like a there's like this grandma asking for her grandson saying like hey do you know where like the closest bath or you know where the bathroom is and he's like well you think it would be in the star market here but it's actually at this the copley square hotel just like down the road right here and so I hear that I all I say to this girl is I say I really have to go to the bathroom right now and I just peace out I don't tell her where I'm going what I'm doing I just like peace out you know which is amazing that you kept it from her this long and yeah. still where yeah, I was like normally vision. interact on the date yeah and so I'm just like I really have to go to the bathroom right now and I just peace out right and so I go and it's like a miracle, right? I'm going, I go into this hotel. I keep on going straight and I turn right. You know, you go left or right. I turn right, the bathroom's right there. And I'm like, Phew. I sit down, <laughs> explode. But because I'm holding it for so long, it's like hurts and I'm like trying to go and it's not like really that great of an experience. So 20 minutes passes by. I'm a long bathroom goer as it is, but like 20 minutes is pretty long, you know, but when somebody's waiting on you too, it's like kind of like, oh, frick, you know? So I get a text from her and I'm like, she's like, is everything okay? I'm like, oh yeah, I'm just like coming. I have to get our, our ticket validated or whatever for parking, so I'll be there, you know? She's like, okay, meet me at like the, you know, the elevators in the store. I'm like, okay. So I get up, I have to go again. So I sit down for another, you know, five minutes or whatever and I have to go again. I'm still just feeling so sick at this point because I held it in for so long. So I, I go, I get my thing validated. As soon as I enter in the grocery store, I panic because I have to go again. And I call up to the grocery store tent, you know, one of the cashiers. I'm like, do you have a bathroom? And they're like, it's upstairs over by the liquor on the right. I'm like, okay, you know. And so I'm going, I go upstairs and I'm like, I'm like panicked at this point. I really have to go, you know, and there's this guy talking to another one of the workers, like just like a, you know, somebody who's shopping, talking to one of the workers. I'm like, like interrupt it. I'm just like, do you know where the bathroom is? And like the guy must have seen that I was in like sheer horror and panic because the guy that was not even the worker, he's like, it's that way, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like points to the thing. And so as I'm approaching it, I go, I see a, a closed restroom closed sign because they were cleaning it or and so I like bypass the sign. I go in there and I just unleash. Meanwhile, the guy that's cleaning the bathroom, he's on the phone and it is loud. I'm telling you, it's on the phone. I'm like, and plus it's supposed to be closed, but I just like bypass and I go to the bathroom. Right. So anyways, I do that. I get another text from him. It's like, Hey, is it, you know, where are you at? You know, I'm like, Oh, I'm like upstairs near like the liquor section. And, stuff. <laughs> and she's like, what? Like, why would it be up there? You know, she's like thinking, I had like a big cut for my kayak that I was carrying and like a big gash in my leg that she knew I had. And she was like, is he getting like, alcohol? this is later she telling me, he's like, is he getting like alcohol for that cut? Like what? Like why would he be like a liquor? You know? 
And, but like, I, did, I was kind of like, I didn't want to be like, yeah, I have explosive diarrhea and yeah, you know, especially as <laughs> like, like the, now, <laughs> now I see it. I'm like, we were like pretty decent friends and it wouldn't have been that big of a deal, especially because everybody had diarrhea when we're in Egypt, like when <laughs> we're on our study abroad. So like, but that was like seven years ago, you know? So like, well, you know, anyways. So I come out and she like had gone up the stairs into the liquor section and like, and I kind of walked by and she just sees me and I'm just like, oh. you know, <laughs> like, I'm like, I'm feeling really sick. I gotta go home. And I had, we had borrowed her roommate's car to go on this date, you know, her, which her roommate had like a Bishop's interview. <laughs> yeah, they, and that, they had to, she had to like postpone or whatever. Cause she was like, cause I had was sick. And so she you, like, didn't, you didn't get the car back in time yeah we didn't get the car back in time and so <laughs> anyways like she, so she she like we get in the car and i had driven the car you know to the date but then she drove it on the way back because i was feeling so sick i'm like curled up i'm seeing like primary children's songs just trying to like get my mind off it i'm feeling so i got to go to the bathroom again meanwhile which one Gibbs said the little stream or what? <laughs> <laughs> what but like I'm, so but the problem is this is downtown Boston and now it is rush hour. And so I, you know, I don't live that far away, but because it's rush hour, instead of like a 15 minute drive, it's like 40 minutes or whatever. And so, and I, you know, rocking and trying to, you know, and so anyways, I, uh, yeah, I get home, we leave and she leaves and then I am on the toilet for the rest of the night. I'm talking all throughout the night to the point where I'm bleeding. And I have a quiz next morning in dental school that I got to be there for, you know? And so like, and by the time in the morning, I feel like okay enough to like go and whatever, but like, and then a couple days later, no blood, all good. <laughs> Just had to get out of your system for a few days. Yeah. Yep. So. <laughs> I mean, it's hard though. It's not like, it's not like it was just that one day. Like there was some significant damage that for days after, you know, yeah. there was these issues for days from what you, <laughs> what you put yourself through. Oh man. That reminds me of a story. Um, <clears throat> I had a buddy call me. This was probably like seven or eight years ago. I'm like, hello. And he's just dying. He's laughing so hard. He can't even talk. <clears throat> I'm like, what? He's like, oh my gosh, dude, I gotta tell you this story. So <clears throat> his brother-in-law just told him this story. As soon as the story ended, he ran to the other room and called me and told me the story. And it was, so his brother-in-law got the story firsthand to his brother-in-law, to him, to me now to you guys <laughs> so the first hand account is there's this dude that his brother-in-law knows he's a big guy he's like six eight and he's not he's not like fat but he's not skinny he's built and he's he's just a big big dude so he's a six eight guy and for work he would fly he'd do like day trips so he'd fly out of like salt lake in the morning do work all day and then at night he'd fly back sometimes so he's on this trip <clears throat> so he doesn't have any like luggage or anything because he's he's not staying the night it's just one day trip he's business casual you know got his briefcase and his dress shirt and his you know slacks or whatever and he goes <clears throat> he goes to the city gets a rental car gets like a van and I, I don't know what he did for work, but he'd pick people up and he'd like drive them around the city. So I don't know if it was like real estate or what, but he has these like clients or potential clients, potential customers riding with him and he's driving around and then bam, 30 second gurgles hit him. You know, it starts gurgling, which usually means, you know, you got 30 seconds to get to the, the bathroom, but <clears throat> He must have had some Mikey Hammond willpower because he was able to like hold it in for a while. So he's driving around and just like, like the pain, you know, like you get like the, the waves of pain that, that come and he's like, I, I gotta pull, I gotta go to that gas station right now. And, but he's, he's gonna feel weird and awkward. 
to just pull into the 7-Eleven and then take off out the van and leave the people sitting there. So he's like, maybe I can, maybe I can hold it for a little bit longer. <laughs> so he does this for like several hours. Oh. And uh, I don't know who came up with this phrase, but my friend told me the story. He said that the guy got to the point where he got the icky poo sweats. <laughs> <laughs> so he's just in pain he's sweating and he like every time they go past a gas station he's like should i stop should i not okay i think i can go a little bit longer i think i can go a little bit longer <clears throat> so then he starts dropping off his people and finally he drops them off he's like okay i'm good now but <clears throat> he's got a flight to catch so he's like he's like beeline it back to the airport and he's every time he's getting like every time he passes a gas station, just one bad decision after another where he, he's like, I think I can go a little bit longer. One more gets to another gas station. I think I can go a little bit longer. So he keeps going. He gets, once he gets to the airport, like he's his like mind control, whatever mind over body is like at its limit. He's like, I can't do this anymore. I just got to pull up at the curb and jump out. But then like once he gets there, he's like, oh, maybe they'll tow my car, whatever. Like, I think I can make it. I think I can make it to the rental car place. So he keeps going, gets to the rental car place, drops his keys. He's booking it into the airport. This huge dude waddling, just waddling, like clenching. And he gets he gets into the air into the bathroom, goes in, goes to the first stall, shuts the door, drops his pants. Before he sits down, just <laughs> explodes everywhere. <laughs> so now he's like looking down, and this is like it's all over the place. So he sits down, finishes, and then he starts like trying to clean up, and he's like, I don't have time for this but it's all over everywhere all over his pants so and he doesn't have a change of clothes so he he takes his pants off he throws his underwear away and he goes over to the far sink in the bathroom and he's washing his his slacks oh so he's 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 got dress shoes dress socks nothing else until his waist, and then he's got his dress shirt. <laughs> so he's like <laughs> butt naked <laughs> from his waist down. He's in the corner in the sink washing his slacks. Oh, in a public <laughs> and he's and he's like frantic because he's he's scared he's gonna miss his flight too. So he's in there, and then obviously it's busy because it's an airport. <laughs> so people are coming in, and some dude comes in. And like walks in slowly and he's like trying to be like <laughs> inconspicuous in the corner with no pants on. And this dude walks in and walks into the stall where he just was, which <laughs> was not cleaned up. And this guy loses it. It just starts swearing like, holy, and just going crazy. <laughs> and the guy's like, just like out of his mind. And he just immediately leaves. And the guy's in the corner like, <laughs> trying, to, trying to make it look like obviously it's not him yeah. so then he like he dries it he's holding his pants under the dryer tries to dry it off puts them on going commando walks out and he's walking down the the hall like to the gates and he can he can smell himself it's <laughs> horrible he's like there's no way no way I can get on a flight like this. Um, so he's like, I, so he starts looking at like the gift shops, like the souvenirs and stuff. He's like, I got to find, I got to find some other piece of clothing. <clears throat> but he's also like scared. He's going to miss his flight. So he's like panicked. He's in a rush. He's trying to figure it out. <laughs> and he finds the only thing he finds that can fit him are like little white, like tennis shorts. <laughs> so he buys them puts them on throws away his slacks and so he's this huge dude right so he's six eight he's massive and he's got he's like john stockton like daisy dukes 
<laughs> it only go down like half of his thighs with <laughs> business shirt, dress socks, dress <laughs> shoes. And he goes and gets on his flight like that. <laughs> and he's sitting next to people on the flight with his big massive thighs like showing. He's like smashed in between these people. And he still reeks. And he notices like right when he gets on the flight, he still has a little bit of poo on the back of his shirt. Oh. <laughs> so he flies home and his wife's waiting for him. And he's like walking <laughs> off. His wife's waiting for him at the pickup and he's got his little briefcase and he's wearing these like John Stock and Daisy Dukes <laughs> tennis shorts. <laughs> oh man. I wonder, I often wonder if Michael's story could have ended something like that, you know? It's just like how much longer did he have before <laughs> it just would have come out? Yeah, and that a lot of people in Boston would be telling that story. Mm -hmm. I hear of other stories out in the reservation. Maybe we'll save that for another time or something. Yeah, you got to go, Ryan? Yeah, I got to go. Okay, yeah, well, thanks, guys. It's been been a pleasure having you both, and let's do it again sometime, huh? Yeah, Always awesome. a pleasure. <laughs> All right, have a good day, guys. Thank you. All right, see you guys. Yeah, see you.